Over the last year or so, I have been collecting a series of questions that have been asked to me uh, by my church members and people over the internet, uh, questions regarding the Bible, Christian life, basic apologetics, that kind of thing. I did the best that I could to answer those questions quickly and in the moment, but I want to take the opportunity here at the beginning of a new year to talk about some of these questions a little bit more fully, a little more in-depth, and uh, I don't want to really give a very thorough answer. I'm sure that you could find many better answers from people that are a lot smarter or more articulate than I am. My goal here is not to give a thorough answer, but more just an easy-to-understand answer. I want to boil it down to something very simple that can be explained in just a couple of minutes. We are going to be looking at these on Sunday mornings, but I want to cut these down and look at individual questions and post them as sort of a podcast uh, every day on Facebook. I'd like for people to be able to continue asking questions. If you've got something that's always bugged you or something you'd just like an answer to or you'd like somebody else's opinion on, hey, just go ahead, send it to me on Facebook, uh, send me a text, email, talk to me in person. I'd love to be able to talk to you and answer some of your questions as best as I possibly can from the Bible. The first question I was asked, and this came from somebody over Facebook, Uh, The first question that was asked, and it's actually a fairly common question among God's people, is how do we know what belongs in the Bible? When you open up your Bible and you say, okay, we've got 66 books here, how do we know that Genesis to Revelation is any different from the Apocrypha, from the Book of Mormon, the Book of Enoch, the Gospel of Thomas? And I just put it setter because there are literally dozens of books that make some kind of claim to be holy or inspired by God. What makes Genesis to Revelation any different from them? I find it very interesting that the Bible itself actually references other books, such as the book of Jasher, the book of the Wars of Our Lord, the Chronicles of Nathan, the book of Jehu. Uh, We know that Solomon himself actually wrote over 1,000 songs, and we only have two of them in our Bible today. Uh, Paul himself often referenced other epistles to the Corinthian church, the Ephesians, and the Laodiceans. In the book of Colossians, he actually says, okay, I wrote a book to you, and I wrote a letter to the Laodicean church, sort of your sister church. I want you to swap them. I want you to get both letters so that you can both read them and both benefit from them. Well, why do we have the Colossian letter but not the Laodicean letter? What's up with that? Why are all these other books not part of our canon of Scripture? Well, we have to ask ourselves, what is a canon to begin with? No, it's not that. It's actually a list of books considered to be authoritative scripture by a particular religious group. Every religious group, every denomination, every faith group has its own canon of scripture. Uh, Whether you are a Mormon, whether you are a Protestant, whether you are Catholic, whether you are Hindu or whatever, you've got your own list of holy books. You've got your own scripture that is considered to be authoritative. The word canon actually comes from the Greek word kanon, meaning ruler or measuring stick. Uh, The most obvious verse that everybody goes to when they're trying to address this kind of a question is 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 through 17. Uh, that we're all fairly familiar with it. It says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But as great as these questions are, they don't really help us to answer this question because everything that's in that verse is highly subjective. Something that might be profitable for one person uh, might not be especially profitable for another. Uh, If just a bunch of guys got together one day and they decided, okay, we're going to form the canon of Scripture, we're going to choose the books that we like and we're going to reject the books that we don't, we're going to pick and choose haphazardly, uh, would that have any authority to it? Is that the books that we should be following or is it just man's opinion? Well, I believe that in order for any particular book to be Scripture, it has to measure up to being theologically cohesive, historically accurate, and it has to be reliably preserved. We'll talk about what all those mean in just a second. Number one, theologically cohesive. It is an absolute modern marvel that the 66 books of our Bible, of our canon of Scripture, all agree doctrinally and theologically. That's unheard of in any other faith group. When you look at their holy books and what they consider part of their canon of Scripture, they are riddled with theological and doctrinal errors and contradictions. Uh, Many would say that the Bible that we hold in our hands is also full of these contradictions and errors, but if you actually read it in depth and you understand what the particular authors were saying at their particular time with their knowledge and their understanding of theology, uh, you begin to understand that a lot of these contradictions simply fall away. What is usually credited as error or a contradiction actually usually has more to do with the way that a certain person is reading a passage of Scripture. Uh, They may not understand everything that that Scripture is saying or the time in which it was written or how it all fits together to form a cohesive body of doctrine. Uh, this is most obvious, especially when you're looking at the gospel records. You've got four different men that wrote uh, these books many, many years apart. Most of them never even met each other. Uh, Matthew and John were both disciples of Jesus, but the time in which they wrote both of these books were years apart. Uh, and I don't believe that these gospel writers ever got together in a room and decided, okay, I'm going to take this part of the story and you're going to take this part and we're all going to collaborate on this. Uh, these books were written decades apart by men who did not work together in any sense of the word. 
In order to measure up to the standard of being inspired Scripture, canon of the Bible, a book or a Scripture passage must also measure up to being historically accurate. In other words, it has to reflect written history of civilization that we have today, as well as modern archaeology. And I'm sure that there are many people who would say that uh, the books that we hold in our hand today do not reflect modern archaeology or the written history of civilization. There's a lot of historical errors, they would say. Uh, but I would also remind them of many different times in, in history when something in the Bible was regarded as a fable or a myth that was later proven to be true by something that we discovered along the line. I've got a couple of uh, things listed here for you. For instance, up until 1993, there was absolutely zero evidence that King David ever existed, or if that he even did exist, he was just a small tribal leader. Until 1993, when we started to dig stuff up and uncover things that proved that everything the Bible says about King David was true. Uh, the Hittites are a famous example of this. Uh, they were mentioned dozens of times in the Old Testament, but nowhere else until 1884. This ancient civilization that nobody knew anything about or didn't even know where they were, uh, this was considered complete myth or fable, something that the Bible writers had fabricated. Uh, up until 1884, this was considered a myth or a fable, but then they started to dig things up and discover that, wait a second, everything the Bible says about them was dead on. I find it very interesting that the University of Chicago today actually offers a Ph.D. in a civilization that was once considered a myth. The Pool of Bethesda was something else that was considered to be a myth or a fable uh, because of what the Bible claimed about it and its uh, healing nature. Uh, there was never any kind of discovery about this. They never knew where it was or even if it existed until 1956 when they dug it up. It's actually fairly recent when you're looking at the world of modern archaeology. Uh, they found it exactly where and how the Bible described it. It was a five-sided pool with five different porticos. It was exactly what the Bible described it as. The city of Jericho is another famous example of something that was discovered many years after the scholars had rejected it as being a fable or a myth. Uh, archaeologists had said for many years that the city of Jericho was never even in existence at the time that the Israelites conquered Canaan, if that ever even happened at all, the conquest itself. Uh, but in 1907, guess what? They dug down a little bit deeper and they found everything that they would have expected to find in an ancient city that was destroyed the way the book of Joshua describes. Another example is Abram's home city of Ur. Uh, this was also considered to be a myth or a fable, a city that did not exist. There was no archaeological evidence of it. There was no historical record of this city, and people rejected it as being false until they actually found it in 1922. They found some very interesting things in that city, things mentioning even Abraham himself. I'm not so sure whether I actually believe everything that they claim to have found, uh, but I'll leave that up to you. Regardless, they found the city. They know where it is. They know that the Bible stands to be true. Uh, another example is the ancient city of Petra. Uh, this was discovered in 1812. Before that time, they considered what Isaiah had to say about this city to be a myth or a fable. Uh, they said that uh, nobody could ever have cut a city out of solid rock at that time. Well, uh, it stands today as one of the most popular tourist destinations in the land of Jordan. Up until recently, there was no evidence to support the Assyrian or Babylonian captivities, at least not as the Bible described them. They said that there was no evidence that Jerusalem was ever besieged until they discovered evidence. Uh, the reason I, I would say all these things is because we need to understand that a lack of evidence has never proven anything to be false, never proved that anything didn't happen. Uh, there's many things that are out there that are still waiting to be discovered, and I absolutely believe that. Look what the Smithsonian had to say about it. Much of the Bible, in particular the historical books of the Old Testament, are as accurate historical documents as any that we have from antiquity, and are in fact more accurate than many of the Egyptian, Mesopotamian, or Greek histories. These biblical records can be and are used, as are other ancient documents, in archaeological work. For the most part, historical events described took place and the people cited really existed. This is from the Smithsonian Department of Anthropology, a bunch of godless heathens if there ever was one. In order to be considered in the scripture, it also has to be reliably preserved. This is where we get our doctrine of preservation. Uh, Mark chapter 13, 31 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Luke 16, 17, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. He's saying that, listen, uh, the heaven and earth are going to fall, fall away before one cross of the T or one dot of the I is going to go away. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 8, Though grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. What does this mean? Basically, if you're going to consider a book of the Bible to be scripture, that means it has to stand forever. It can't be lost for hundreds of years. It can't be rediscovered. It's got to be there. From the time that Paul put pen to paper or John wrote anything down from the book of Revelation or whatever you want to say, any book that is in the Bible, we have had that from the very beginning. It wasn't lost for any length of time. We have had it from the very beginning. It has stood and will stand forever. 
And the books of the Old Testament and New Testament are in a league of their own regarding reliable preservation and accuracy. When you compare it to any other ancient document, uh, for instance, you look at Homer's Iliad, I think there's only four copies that date within 500 years of its writing, uh, and even those are not very accurate compared to what we have in the New Testament, or the Old Testament for that matter. A uh, famous example of this is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are a fascinating, groundbreaking discovery. It's not very recent by any means, but they date as far back as 385 B.C., just a couple of years after the Old Testament was completed, and it contains sections of nearly every Old Testament book, 99.5% accurate to the next oldest copies that we had, which are a thousand years newer than the ones that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were extremely accurate. Uh, For instance, the book of Isaiah was contained in nearly its entirety, was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there were literally only three errors. There were only three differences between that book and what we had in our next oldest copy. And you know what those three errors or differences were? Spelling errors, okay? These books were meticulously copied and handed down from one generation to the next. The Word of God has been preserved and will continue to be for the rest of eternity. Uh, The New Testament is also remarkably preserved with thousands of nearly identical copies, portions dating as far back as 114 A.D., just a couple of years, like 25 years after the book of Revelation was completed. Absolutely amazing. And everybody wants to know, hey, why don't we have the manuscripts, the originals today? Well, it's fairly simple. They were just destroyed over time. Most of these books were probably used a lot. They were handed down from one person to the next to the next. If you've got a 200-year-old book today, it's actually kind of rare Uh, And it's most likely falling apart unless great care has been taken to avoid it being broken down. Uh, In the Bible times, it was actually even more difficult for a book to be maintained and preserved simply because it wasn't written on paper uh, like we have today. It was written on either papyrus or on vellum, sort of an animal skin. And those things, they just break down because of the humidity and the sunlight, etc., The Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were preserved very well because they were hidden in a cave. They uh, were away from any kind of sunlight, away from any kind of humidity, and so that's why they were able to be preserved when many of the other books simply weren't. This is not really something that bothers most uh, scholars and textual critics. Okay, so back to these lost books of the Bible that we're actually talking about. Why aren't they Scripture? Because they are flawed in at least one of these three ways. Uh, For instance, many of these books clearly contradict biblical teaching. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, Several of these books contain historical and prophetical errors. Either they said something happened that clearly didn't. They contain an error. They say one person's name when they really should have said another. If it's not perfect, it's not the Word of God. Uh, Or they were discovered, quote-unquote, hundreds of years after they were supposedly written. If that's the case, then they were not preserved. Uh, What is probably more accurate is to say that they were actually frauds, that they were not written by the person that they say that book was written by. Uh, If you look at uh, the the Epistle of Barnabas or the Gospel of Thomas or the Book of Enoch or anything like that, for that instance, uh, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that these books were not written by those actual men. They are clearly frauds. Uh, The Apocrypha is probably one of the most persistent uh, groups of books that people claim to be Scripture. If you've ever looked at a Catholic Bible, you'll know that they've got all kinds of books that we don't have in our Bible. Uh, The Apocrypha contains ten short books as well as additions to the books of Daniel and Esther, which we have in our Bible. The interesting thing about the Apocrypha is that it was never actually considered scripture by the Jewish people, or by anybody for that matter, up until the 1500s. It was considered a historical document, it might have been some good reading, but it never was really considered scripture seriously by anybody of real Jewish or Christian faith until the 1500s. The Apocrypha also contains some pretty serious doctrinal errors. Uh, If you ever wonder where the Catholics get some of their crazy ideas about purgatory, the afterlife, praying for the dead, and all all this crazy stuff about offering money and and, and all those crazy things. Uh, Most of it actually comes from the Apocrypha. If you look at uh, chapter number 12 of the book of Tobit, verse number 9, For alms delivereth from death, and the same is that which purgeth away sins, and maketh to find mercy and life everlasting. Some pretty crazy stuff there. 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verse 43, And making a gathering, he sent 12,000 drachms of silver, a lot of money, to Jerusalem for sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the dead, thinking well and religiously concerning the resurrection. Uh, This is where a lot of this crazy stuff comes from. The Apocrypha is full of it. Uh, The Apocrypha also contains a lot of historical errors about the time in which it claims to be written. One or two might be a fluke. It might even be a misreading on our part, a misunderstanding. Uh, But when you're looking at the number, the quantity, as well as the degree of the historical errors that are there, it just becomes silly to say that something that contains so many errors could actually be the Word of God. Is it a sin to read the Apocrypha or any other book for that matter? No, no, not any more than it would be to read any other kind of secular book. Uh, But 
we would ought to be very careful before we would elevate this to the point of actually being Scripture. Uh, the only reason it was ever considered to be Scripture at all was to defend Catholic dogma. Uh, when you go back to the 1500s at the Council of Trent, you've got a bunch of Protestants that are actually starting to read the Bible for the first time ever, and uh, they realize that a lot of what the Catholics have been preaching and teaching over the years has been completely unbiblical. And so the Catholics, they hemmed and they hawed, and they tried to find uh, some answers for them. And so they pulled out the only source that they could find that would defend what they believed, and that was in the Apocrypha. Just part of the long history of the Catholic Church trying to change God's mind for them uh, when it became convenient to them. That's all I've got for this question today. Uh, if you've got any other questions, anything that you'd like to have answered, I'll do the best that I can. Uh, you can email them to me. You can message me on Facebook. You can call me at 607-349-2141. I'd love to be able to talk to you and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, and God bless.